start now. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, and welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome to this webinar that we'll be having today. Uh, the, the titles, as you may see in the presentation, is like, uh, is designing at the peak. Having to have a Darcy Duran, instructional design, both Dr. President Carlos Morales from Tarrant County Community College will be introducing her. For a, I, a, he start his, his uh, presentation of speaker, I would like to recognize that for this webinar, we have a, more than 30 people. register and I hope that for example we have registered from the University of San Bernardino, EDP University, Framingham, Ostos, a Community College, ICPR, National University, Oklahoma, a Southeast uh, Missouri State University, also from Tarrant County, a, the Connect Campus, a Universidad Ana Jemendez in Puerto Rico, and also we have, let's see that I lose the. And you, Belki, you are, you are breaking up a little bit. <clears throat> So we have from University of Miami, registered and also from University of Hello? I think we lost you, Bell, please. No? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Darcy. You, Belkis, are you still there? Okay. Can you hear me again? Oh, okay. Sorry, I was uh, saying that we have uh, registered more than 30 people for this webinar from uh, 14 member institutions in Puerto Rico and in the States. And just to remember that we are recording this webinar for the benefit from the ones who can you know, join us today so we can share this information. Our presenter will have 50, around 50 minutes to share the, their presentation. Uh, and at the end, we will have time for questions from the audience through the chat of the Collaborate platform that uh, so everybody can uh, put your questions there. And again, we will be recording for the benefit for the of the ones who could not join us uh, today live. So uh, I want you to welcome President Carlos Morales. He's the leader of this uh, distant learning uh, group or, or head Task Force, and he will be introducing our speaker, uh, our today's speaker. Thank you. Go ahead, Carlos. Okay, good afternoon. Can you hear me well? Yes, I can hear you. Good, just checking. Uh, thank you, Jubelkis, for the, for the introduction and for the opportunity to continue this series of um, webinars for the HEADS uh, community. I am um, <clears throat> pleased to, to uh, introduce my colleague and friend, uh, Darcy Duran, which is a director of instructional uh, design at uh, Colorado Community Colleges online, and she will be delivering a, a session in regards to online course design at the peak Colorado Community College online approach to centralized course design. I will ask the participants to refer to the to the email invite where all the details about the presentation are uh, um, outlined and provided, so that way, you know, I am not repeating too many of the of the items there but it is important to highlight that this is the result of a task of the work of a task force back in in, in 2018 and we are just going a uh, little by little month month through month uh, and scheduling uh, many of the topics that the audience identified as areas of interest so with that said i am going to um, pass the microphone to uh, darcy darcy take it away
Okay. Well, in the in the meantime, let me just go over over some of the some of the aspects of the of the presentation. Uh, well, first of all, the background of a uh, Colorado Community Colleges Online is not a college in uh, in itself is an extension of a service that uh, helps 13 home colleges in regards to online and uh, uh, instructional design and all those services. Uh, Darcy is the lead in terms of uh, the instructional design aspect, the technology aspects, and how faculty can use uh, technology to uh, not only teach online, but also augment uh, anything else they do in the classroom. I think she's back in line, so uh, if that is okay, Darcy, take it away. Great. Can you hear me, Carlos? Yes. Awesome. Okay. Well, hopefully uh, this will continue to work. So um, I appreciate the um, the invite to have uh, to have a conversation with you all today. Um, as uh, Carlos had mentioned, my name is Darcy Duran, and I'm the instructional design director at Colorado Community Colleges Online. Just a little bit of background about myself. Um, I have been in higher ed for about 14 years. I started as an instructional technologist and web page paraprofessional at Eastern Wyoming College in Torrington, Wyoming. Um, I was in that position for, for about four years and then I was asked to move into the marketing department as their webmaster and uh, social media officer. And I do have a degree in website administration um, and I started my career as a web designer and graphic designer, so that's why I was asked to, to take on that position. Um, after being in that role for about three years, uh, I just remembered um, that I really do have a passion for how technology can enhance student learning. So I finished up my master's degree in instructional technology and I got a job at Trinidad State Junior College in Trinidad, Colorado as their distance ed tech, um, uh, technology specialist. And um, I was there for a few years before I came up to uh, CCC Online, and I've been here for about four years. My role is I, um, I lead a team of six instructional designers and e-learning technologists. And our primary function is to develop and design and maintain about 230 course shells at CCC Online. I'm also a Quality Matters peer reviewer, and I also facilitate the online and face-to-face um, APPQMR, the Applying the Quality Matters rubric for Quality Matters and for the state of Colorado. So um, today's agenda, we're going to, um, I'm just going to talk about the uh, learning objectives a bit. Um, what is CCC Online? Our scope of centralized course design here at CCC Online. I'm going to talk about um, a pilot that we recently, um, we recently conducted. Uh, talk a little bit about our academic excellence and professional development, and go into our strategy and sustainability. So our learning objectives today, we will examine strategies used in planning and implementing centralized course design within a state community college system. We will discuss the evolution of course design and quality assurance process. And the impact of centralized course design and quality assurance um, policies on instructional practices and academic policies. So um, Carlos has kind of started a little bit talking about what is CCC Online. Um, CCC Online is not a college in itself, but it is um, more of a service to all of the community colleges in Colorado. There's 13 of them. Um, we do. We are set up very similar to a college in that we um, have an instructional design team, uh, department. We have an academic um, services area where we have about 450, uh, 452 instructors. Um, we have 17 program chairs, three associate deans, a dean of instruction. We also have a student services group. Um, we have an academic technology department. We have business services as well. Um, so in many aspects, we have the same kind of services that a college would normally have. Um, we do um, offer only online courses, and we also deliver those online courses. So that is our function. Um, we have about 230 courses that we, um, that we build and maintain, and we have about 400 or 2,300 sections annually, 
and that comes out to about 44,000 student enrollments each year. We also offer um, 15, 10, and six-week terms, and we have found that that, um, that flexibility also helps our um, diverse or, or, or uh, diverse uh, college student base. So um, who are our students? Um, so 33% of CC Online students are represented by underserved uh, groups, with over 80% being non-traditional adult learners. So we definitely um, um, service the adult learner with the average age of 29. We do have uh, primarily female students and um, primarily white students, although our uh, Hispanic, we've seen the Hispanics are um, uh, students really um, rising in numbers in the last couple of years as well. Um, we also have a, a, a variety, um, a mix of rural and urban students because of the nature of our online courses. Um, we are able to have a, a section with students where there, we can have students that are in, that are living in Denver and we can have students in that same section who are living in a small town like Lamar with a couple thousand um, population. And that, that really, um, I think, gives a rich diversity that other, um, other classes that I've seen doesn't quite have because we are able to mix so many different um, cultures and diversities. Um, the student population in those courses. So I really think that it, be, um, it gives us more of a, um, an, a, a, full, a fuller student experience in those courses. So just a little bit more about what uh, CC Online is and does versus our um, member colleges. As mentioned before, um, CC Online isn't a college in itself. Um, but it also has, uh, how it's set up is that the, uh, if you want to take a CC online course, you'll need to uh, enroll in one of your, um, in, you'd need to enroll in a home college. So once you um, enroll in a home college, then you, then you can um, sign up for a CCC online course. Um, CC online, for instance, we, we develop and deliver the courses. We hire and evaluate the instructors. We hire our subject matter experts, which we call them SMEs. We also administer our um, LMS, the learning management system for the, for the state of Colorado as well for the community colleges. We do use Desire to Learn. We have 24-7 help desk. We have an online librarian. We offer online tutoring, and we are a quality matters school. Um, at the colleges, uh, we don't do advising um, per se. Um, so the college, you would need to get the advising there. You register there, uh, the, award, the grades are awarded at the home college. Uh, they do, uh, the college is accredited. We're not, but we do uh, support the accreditation of those colleges. Our accrediting um, body is the Higher Learning Commission. They have, uh, the colleges have a, a curriculum and they use the Common Course Numbering System. And we call it the Common Course Numbering System or the CCCNS. Uh, what Colorado has is that, uh, all college, all the courses have the same um, competencies. So if you're taking a um, uh, English comp class at one college, you're going to have the same competencies at another college, and so that really helps make sure that there's um, consistency um, across the colleges. And when they transfer, um, the the colleges that are they transferring to also are aware of the co the competencies that they're that that is, that student is learning. So that's really, um, I'm, I'm quite thankful that Colorado has something like that. It makes, makes my job a lot easier. Um, one thing I, just one thing I did want to mention too, we also, uh, before I move on, we also um, do uh, offer online courses to other colleges outside, outside of the state of Colorado. For instance, Dawson Community College in Montana, we uh, we design and deliver all of their online courses, so we, we are looking at different um, of avenues of, of, um, of partnering with different colleges as well, and not just in Colorado. So, um, let's talk a little bit about the centralized course development process here in, um, at CCC Online. Um, Primarily, the team is is um, 
what, what we do is we, we build a team together when we uh, decide that we're going to do a course, and that, that primary team is the subject matter expert um, and the instructional designer. Um, the program chair is basically the, um, the project sponsor, um, and they're there to help the subject matter expert if they have any questions, especially when they're delivering their content. So um, once we have the, figured out what the, uh, the scope of the project will be, then we have a vision meeting. That's up there in the upper left-hand corner with that blue dot. Um, at the vision meeting, we'll basically talk about why are we here, what's the vision of the, the overall vision of the course, um, get, a, get a preliminary scope of, of work. We also um, kind of decide, is this going to be a full development? Are we going to start from scratch, or is this going to be maybe an um, enhancement or an update, like a textbook update, for instance? That's kind of when those decisions are made during the vision meeting. Um, after the vision meeting, we give the subject matter expert about two weeks to uh, fill out a course map, and they do have assistance from the instructional designer. The instructional designer is also kind of acts as a project manager as well during during a course development. Um, so once the course map or the blueprint is is built, then um, after about two weeks, we have a um, project kickoff. And during that kickoff, kickoff is really where um, the details get figured out exactly. Um, who is going to be involved in the team, if we're going to need um, to bring in any additional resources, um, if we're going to talk about any um, specific assessments that we might want to do, or, or um, if we wanted to build any assets like um, interactive, uh, interactives or video, that type of thing is kind of figured out during that time. Um, we also figure out our uh, timeline as well. We have about four to five months to do a complete um, full development is usually what it takes. We can do it in, um, in less time if it's more of like an update or um, an enhancement. It just kind of depends on the project. But um, usually four to five months is how long it takes to do a full development. Um, we also use something what we're, what we're um, exploring is with uh, rapid prototyping techniques. So basically after that, that kickoff, the, um, and if we have a solid course map, which is our blueprint, we, the, the subject matter expert is then tasked to go and um, start building content um, and start um, handing over content to the instructional designer. We usually do this, um, we chunk it out, so we'll do module by module. So for instance, for the first module, uh, the subject matter expert will develop the content and then they'll hand it over to the instructional designer. Then the instructional designer immediately puts it into um, desire to learn and starts actually building the course. Um, we used to wait and, until we had all of the content and then start building the course out. But the, a challenge that we found doing that way is that if we um, come into uh, mis misunderstandings or if there's some sort of a challenge, we don't catch those challenges until the very end of the development. And that's almost too late. So we found if we start doing this rapid prototyping where we're building and we can discuss things as we're building things out, then we can actually catch some of those misunderstandings or if, if it starts going off, the, if a project is kind of going off um, scope, then um, well, we can catch that faster. And it also offers more conversation between this, this me and the instructional designer. Um, and I've seen some really, um, some really fun conversations come out from, from that rapid prototyping technique. Um, so that we, we kind of do that rinse, repeat, uh, for the five modules in the syllabus until the course is finished. And that's when we um, have an official, um, we have checklists and we have an official uh, quality assurance individual that goes into each of our courses to make sure that um, our courses are as high quality as we can. And then we, um, once the final uh, approval is done, then we um, hand off the course to our academic technology folks. And once that happens, um, See, with our master course shell, uh, we have, we, we don't let anybody get in there to edit those for the most part except for a handful of people because that's like our pristine shell. But when the, the course is getting ready to go live for a semester, then we make a term master from that master shell. And in the term master is where we have a lead instructor. And that in that term master, the lead instructor can set things up like dates, uh, release conditions, the type of things that are, would be unique for that, for that um, semester. And then um, once it's determined how many sections we, we need for, for that cycle, for that semester, 
then uh, sections are then uh, made from that term master, and then the individual instructors and students are then um, assigned to each of the sections. And that is where the instructor um, for each section would go in and uh, customize their course for themselves. Um, for the most part, they're, they don't change the content too much um, because we want to assure alignment. But they can go in and, and um, add, um, they can add like their own uh, um, announcements or obviously their own um, contact information, things like that to personalize it. So the heart of our um, course design is what we call the Master Course Template, or MCT. Um, it's basically a standardized blueprint um, that that we have found. Um, I think the first iteration of the MCT was in 2013, and we've had four since then. So we're continuously improving our MCT. Um, what we have found um, that our students actually do really like at master course templates, um, course designs, because once you once a student goes into one of our courses, it, they pretty much have the same um, experience, navigation experience. If, um, if you've taken one of our courses, you're going to have the same experience with the rest of them. So our students, we want our students to focus on learning the content and not trying to learn um, navigation. And that can be a challenge if a, a course, if a student goes into a course and every course is, is uh, designed differently. Um, so it's, we, we don't want to have them experience cognitive overload in that aspect. So we really do like the concept of a master course template. Plus our um, MCT does give enough flexibility so that people can do some com customization. Um, and we also really um, encourage our instructors to give, um, spend their time in, um, in feedback um, of the assignments, um, in the discussion areas, in announcements. Um, we really want them to focus on teaching and not um, focus so much on, um, on uh, designing the course. Also, the MCT helps ensure alignment of our courses and module objectives. Um, it, it provides a, this means a clear design template for each module, and it uh, facilitates input of course content by the SME and ID so that, the, um, so that our, our quality matters standards can be met. Now, um, I've been talking about quality matters a bit, so I thought I'd better go back and kind of explain what um, quality matters or QM is for anybody that may not um, be familiar with uh, QM. So just uh, briefly, I won't go into it too much, but um, Quality Matters is a nonprofit organization that is recognized as a leader in quality assurance for online education. Its mission is to promote and improve the quality of online education and student learning through research-based rubrics and standards that provide objective, evidence-based ways to evaluate the components of online learning through an online peer review process. It does this by fostering a culture of continuous improve improvement by integrating QM standards and processes into organizational plans to improve the quality of online education. So our um, MCT fulfills um, there's 42 specific review standards and eight general standards in the Quality Matters rubric, and our MCT fulfills 26 of those, uh, 42. Um, we have 14 essential standards, eight very important standards, and four important standards that, that are addressed. And, uh, there's, and then we're able to address the 17 specific review standards just through the, um, the organic communication that happens between this me and the instructional designer. And here's kind of a screenshot of um, what one of our modules looks like in our MCT. Um, I'm not sure if I can share my screen. Um, let me see if I can do this without. Um, Please allow me to. Whoa. All right. 
right, sorry about that. I don't think it's going to let me share my screen the way I want it to. Um, Hold on. I get back into the PowerPoint. Sorry about that. And Darcy, you may want to share a, either an application or a window if you are looking for that sample course. In that, you know. Yeah. If you open the other tab, we should be able to see it fine. Can you see that, Carla? Yeah, we can see it there. Yes. yes. Oh, great. Perfect. Um, so this is um, the uh, what our master course template looks like. So when we build a course, we uh, build just a empty shell, and then we uh, import this master course template into each of our shells. So this is how we um, start our development process. So if you see here, we just have a couple welcome an announcements. And uh, this is where we're all, we ask the instructor to put their name in and also to get started. So they go to the content on the nav bar um, to get started. And then we have a start here section. We also have a syllabus. And uh, we do um, chunk out our syllabus. It's not just one really long document because then people can go in and um, just if they like, for instance, if they wanted to see um, instructor information or how they're going to be graded, they can go right to that page immediately. So uh, we have we like how that um, how that chunking is involved there. Um, we've also found that uh, five modules tends to to work pretty well for us because we do have the 15, 10, and six week sessions. And we just use one um, dev shell, development shell, um, for each session. So the flexibility of the five modules seems to work well. And I can just show you here. Um, for module one, for instance, all of, the, um, all of our courses have an introduction. Um, kind of introduces you to the course and what this, this module is going to be talking about. Um, we have an activities list where they'll read, practice, discuss, and do. And the red, the, uh, the red text that you see there is stuff that our instructional designers, it's more to remind them of what needs to be placed in there and what can go. Um, and we also have explorations. And what explorations are is they tend to be um, more in-depth. Um, they're almost like a lecture, I guess, if you were in a face-to-face -face classroom. Um, they just give you a little bit more um, kind of a lecture material uh, for the students that's outside of the book. Um, and then depending on that, we almost always have discussions in every uh, module because I think um, discussions are very important in an online learning environment. Um, then we'll have the assignments and quizzes if there's any. So that's uh, pretty simple, but we have found that it's, uh, it works really well. All right, let me see if I can stop sharing here. Oh, I lost my place. Hold on just one second. Great. So um, our academic excellence um, department we are um, center we also work very closely with and that's where um, they help us with curriculum mapping um, we've also been looking at currently we're looking at the um, alignment in our 27 highest enrollment courses um, as I mentioned before the CCNS is um, 
extremely valuable. I'm glad Colorado has something like that so that we can um, assure alignment and that um, students are learning what we're, we're claiming that they're learning. Um, some lessons learned that we've uh, done over the last couple of years with this process is um, we really, the importance of creating meaningful grading rubrics is um, it, it, writing, if anyone's written rubrics before, it can be a bit of an art. Um, and to be able to really write, um, write meaningful rubrics is, is so important. Um, and also that helps with our um, assessment when we're doing alignment. Um, and we've also found, again, like I said, that having the five modules um, really is, um, is one of our strengths, I think, in our course design. Um, Something about our uh, uh, CCNS um, is also about our, we, we also, Colorado also has what they call a GT pathway, a guaranteed transfer pathway. And there's an articulation agreement with the community colleges as well as the four years in Colorado where if, um, and that helps because of the CCNS and the, the guaranteed transfers, that if you take a, like let's say we take an English 121 course at one of the community colleges, it will automatically be um, accepted at one of the four years as an English 121. Um, so that, that really is, is something that's, that's very powerful and useful for our student and our student success as well. Um, um, again, we're really focusing on developing our courses with assessment in mind. Um, it, with the, again, with the rubrics, um, we're really trying to focus on consistent grading practices with our instructors, um, and the rubrics we have found have, have helped immensely with this. Um, and at CC Online, we're always, always continuously improving. Um, we've realized that, that uh, collaboration is critical. Um, and then uh, we also have a teaching excellence team that um, ensures quality and accountability, not just for our um, design, but for our instructors as well. We do have a subject matter expert um, orientation. We found that um, our SMEs were not properly, didn't seem like they were quite ready to go into a full development if they've never done anything like that, which is understandable. Um, so we do have a one-week facilitated training for our SMEs, and um, that it just kind of goes over what to be, is to be expected. Um, during a course design. Um, one of the biggest pilots that we've done recently, I'll just go over it briefly so that we can get to questions, um, is that um, we, one of our goal was that we wanted to do a Z degree. So uh, a Z degree, for anyone that may not, may not know, is a, a pathway to a degree or credential that has zero textbook cost by using course materials made up of open educational resources, or OER. Um, so we wanted to do um, early childhood education, and the scope was to redesign all of our ECE courses with OER um, materials, and this would be the first of its kind in the state of Colorado. Um, so we launched that in spring 19. So it took us it took us about six months to to do all the courses to make them OER um, using the, the instructional design team and subject matter experts. And some of the things that we were considering when we were thinking about doing um, this pilot was um, the opportunities, obviously, the student access and student costs. The students wouldn't have to um, pay hundreds of dollars for an, a textbook. Uh, a couple of the challenges that uh, the unintended consequences, I guess, that we had kind of looked at as far as risks were the long-term maintenance in case one of the open education resources um, materials went away. How would we replace that and replace that quickly, especially if it was in a live course? And also, uh, finding cultural relevant materials can be a little bit of a challenge. I was kind of surprised by that. We had to actually purchase images of um, diverse students. Um, so really quick for anyone that doesn't know what OER is, um, we've kind of been talking about it. Um, OER is, according to the William and Flora Hewitt Foundation, our um, OER um, resources that reside in the public domain or have been released under an intellectual property license that permits their free use and uh, repurposed by others. Um, so CC Online has its own um, operational definition of OER, and basically it's no, no textbook costs are required for the students. But they may need, still need to um, pay for like a lab kit 
um, software or hardware um, for their courses. Those would be side um, purchases for the student. Um, we've also found that um, we we pay for um, the library resources that CC Online pays that so the student doesn't need to. Um, we have a lot of um, content that we use from there. We also build a lot of our own assets. The team, um, Ivy Learning Technologists that can build assets. Um, and we have videos and um, other types of things like that that they can that CC Online provides for the student. Um, the biggest thing that was a little bit different about the OER development that we discovered was that we really needed to bring in our, our online librarian. The basic concept was still pretty much the same, but um, we needed to curate a lot more um, content because we didn't have that book um, that the textbooks that normally we have when we use a publisher. Um, also, the, the SME was asked to do more writing, and we're, we call it a central narrative. So um, the SME needs to write more to bring in all of the different um, OER resources together. Sometimes we could find like an OpenStax book, but often we couldn't. Um, so those were two of the bigger challenges. Also, um, I had to support the team a little bit more in bringing in um, the learning technologists to help um, build their unique um, assets as well. Um, so just a couple of the outcomes, um, we were able to, um, a, a student can get a degree without buying textbooks um, at uh, Colorado Community Colleges for the, at an, in an ECE program. Um, of course, they'd have to go through their home college since we don't actually offer the degree, but we offer all the, the courses for it. And um, Something that we're pretty proud of, um, CC Online does currently, will, or will have 82 um, OER courses developed by fall of 19. And for our savings during spring of 19, the OER courses have saved our students um, a little over uh, $372,000 um, in textbook costs. And the Z degree alone, um, for the one semester saved our students fifty thousand uh, dollars over fifty thousand dollars so we're pretty um, we're pretty happy about those results um, like I said before we have about 82 OER courses that we're going to be launching in fall of 2019 and we are looking at um, developing more Z degree options and a couple that we're looking at are the um, history and psychology um, possibly in English um, we're, we're still uh, exploring those options. So, um, and with that, I guess I um, I can take any questions if there are any. Thank you, Darcy, for the for the information this afternoon. I guess there is a question coming from from chat, uh, and I lost that one really quick. Uh, I think Diane Hamilton. Uh, oops, I lost your question. Would you would you send it again, Diane? Please. Um, I, I see it in there. How large is my design team? Um, I have. Uh, we have six six um, instructional designers and e-learning technologists. Uh, right now, we have it kind of grouped into, um, I have two level two instructional designers, two level one instructional designers, and two e-learning technologists. And one of the instructional designers actually does a lot of our um, quality assurance as well. Thank you. I think I saw someone raise a, their hand. I guess there is another question coming. I guess while the question comes, uh, Darcy, uh, you mentioned the C degree as a as a you know as an initiative. Uh, maybe you mentioned this, but can you tell about which which subjects are already uh, you know in terms of the C degree itself? You know the complete program. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Uh, so in the, Z, the, the early childhood education Z degree that um, we'll have completely ready to launch by fall of 19, um, we obviously have, I want to say there's 10 
ECE um, individual courses that are part of that program. Um, there's also a, um, let's see, there's college algebra, there's um, psychology, there's an English, um, there's some social sciences. We do have um, Spanish um, that is OER. Um, we have um, some biology lab courses that are OER. Um, so we have, uh, many, most of our courses are more gen ed type courses um, mm -hmm. that we offer. So um, we have several. Um, ROER right now, and that's been able to support the ECE Z degree. Excellent. And, and Darcy, you have the next question on the on the chat, which is from Will. Which are the main tasks for the e-learning technologies? You can talk about those. I'm sorry, Carlos. I couldn't quite hear you. Yes. Which are the main tasks for the e-learning technologies? The main tasks. Yeah. Um, well, I need. It, they are actually uh, kind of the job that I would want if I was on the team designing courses because uh, they get to do instructional design. Um, so they work with the subject matter expert and um, they help um, you know, ensure alignment and assessments and they build the course out. But they also, um, I, their specialty is more to support the team in building um, assets. So when I say assets, I'm talking about like uh, they use Articulate Storyline quite a bit. Um, to build interactive scenarios or games or knowledge checks. Um, that's part of the explorations piece I was talking about earlier. Um, they also um, can do video. Um, yeah, just uh, anything technology related, they're my guys. I see. All right. Uh, you has a question, which is, does the course design allow to integrate mobile devices? Um, yes, we do. We have been exploring a little bit with mobile. Um, we want to make sure that the um, the courses are um, um, web accessible. Um, WCAG 2.0 AA standards. We, all of our courses meet our. Um, we strive to meet that. Um, we also make sure that the V2L in itself is pretty mobile friendly, and so are our courses. So there's that responsive design that we always look at. Plus, we always, um, as part of our quality assurance, we test on um, smartphones and like um, tablets as well as just our computers. So we, we do try to make them as mobile friendly as possible. But um, I think I think we have a, a little ways to go there. So I don't know if a student can completely uh, take their class on their smartphone. But um, we're, we're definitely trying our best to, to keep that um, to, to keep that mobile friendly. Thank you. I guess there is another question being typed on the chat window uh, from Rafael Melendez. I'm not sure if you can see it, Darcy. Um, I, I saw it briefly. I don't know. It's something about the nursing program. Yes, I can, I can frame it for you. Did you encounter issues adopting nursing or practicum courses from health-related disciplines into OER format? And if so, in terms of use, uh, I mean, what about in terms of use of the instructional materials? So it's, it's a two-part question. Okay. Um, for the first part, um, we don't have a lot of, of uh, courses right now for health programs. Um, we do have a, um, it's, a, what is it, a term, a medical terminology that mm -hmm. is an OER course. Um, that, and we have a couple of human nutrition, that type of thing. Um, we, we found that we needed to um, make sure that we had a subject matter expert that knew um, that we'd worked with before and knew the kind of writing that would be involved in these. We also found that we had to, to build a lot of our own um, assets. Um, so yeah, it was, it, it was definitely uh, more work to do those classes. Um, but I don't know if our, um, because we don't actually offer programs, we just have to make sure that our competencies meet the state competencies for that individual class. And sure. then I wasn't sure, I can remember what the second part of that question was, Carlos? I guess the other part is in terms of the use of instructional materials. You know, one thing is on the student side and the other one is from the teaching side in regards to OER. Um, yeah, so if um, we find a lot of our content through Creative Commons um, and we're able to like actually remix a lot of that um, content, which is great. Um, we just have to look at what the, um, 
the copyright is on that. Yes. Um, so, and we also try to keep our, uh, we do have a learning object repository that the state has just been rolling out. So there's another option for us to share um, our OER resources within the state. Um, Plus, we're, um, we try to keep our courses, um, like a lot of, we have a media server, so I try to use that when I can, just to make sure that our, the materials don't go away for our students or for our instructors. Um, I hope that answered the question. Yes, yes, thank you. Any other questions from the audience? I guess, I guess one is coming from Diane. Hamilton. Oh, comment. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Diane. Any other questions or areas that were not, you know, clear in regards to, you know, maybe she went too fast or, you know, had additional questions or comments that uh, Darcy can uh, expand now that we have a few minutes? One, as the next question comes up, the, the intention of this webinar series is to provide, you know, as a point of reference information in terms of a, either how to establish an operation to support distance learning, online learning, or how to enhance one, or how to learn from, from others that are, you know, doing, doing a, you know, a innovative a, activities and, and new things for their institutions in regards to online learning. So again, trying to address several levels of, of needs and, and, and you know, uh, knowledge and practice in the audience. There are two questions, one from Dorian. If we have further questions, what is your contact info, Darcy? Um, sure, I can put it in, uh, um, I can put my email address in the chat. There you go. So oh, thank you, thank you yeah. for that. Right yeah, there. So please contact me. I'd love to talk about this kind of stuff. <laughs> there is another question from Rafael. How often do you revise your master course shell? Part one and part two, does it coincide with the program evaluation cycle? So two part question. How um, often great do question. You yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, so for our master course template, we do look at it every year. Um, usually in the summer um, when things are a little slower sometimes sometimes um, so uh, we do look at it every year um, and to do major revisions because we do do the uh, continuous improvement obviously but like for instance quality matters came out with their sixth edition rubric this last summer so we had to uh, the team and I and uh, Center for Academic Excellence went and had a uh, all-day session where we looked at our master course template and made sure that the uh, new standards and the revised standards for the sixth edition rubric were being met or addressed or how we would do that. So um, that ended up being a pretty big, um, well, not huge, but it, it was significant enough to have a new master course template. So we always look at it every year and I would say every couple years we actually have one that I would say consider different enough to actually have its own designation. Um, and as far as, um, what was the second one about program reviews? Yes, if it the, if it coincides with the program evaluation cycle. Mm, okay, that's a good question. Um, since we're not a college, we don't really look at programs themselves, um, but we do assessment on the in individual classes, and um, so that that is uh, I think that's something that they usually do in fall. Um, I'm not directly involved in the assessment activities. Our center for exam and our center for Academic Excellence Director does that, um, but yeah, we, we, we work too closely together, but we don't do actual program reviews, we're more of like course reviews. Excellent, excellent. Well, uh, <clears throat> this has been great and uh, important to say that we started with, with 18 at this and we <laughs> still have 16, so it has been very interesting. We have been able to keep up the the momentum and the and the uh, participation and interest. So thank you to all of you. I don't think there are any other questions. Uh, and Yubelkis, if you are still connected, uh, take it away. Yes, of course. Thank you, Darcy, a lot. Uh, on behalf of the Heads Consortium, our office here, and all of our members who were able to join in us, 
Uh, we really w would like to thank you for your time, your interest, and your excellent presentation. And this is the first one of this semester. We are coordinating others, so stay tuned for the new topics and dates. Uh, so you can from it. Thank you so much, and thank you, Carlos uh, Morales, uh, for leading this uh, uh, this exchange with the speaker. And thank you, Darcy, again for your time. And thank thank you all of the participants who have the time to be live with us. Thank you so much. Have a good afternoon to everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate the opportunity. Have a great afternoon. Likewise. Thank you.